I want to address certain slogans out there, such as, my body, my choice, or my body, my rules. The notions are applicable in a wide variety of contexts, they underpin the notions of individualism. The main critique of these kinds of notions boils down to the reality that it is universally applicable, and hence it is not gender specific, and doesn't actually suggest much in regards to how relationships of any sort actually function. In the current, these slogans are most oft associated with the issues of abortion, however, the disposition has and is used in far more broad applicability. Here we will firstly address these other notions, a later piece in this series will deal with the abortion question in particular. Their applicability at most applies to the person who views themselves as an island in and of themselves. The self-sufficient person who literally needs no one. The problems with this ought be rather obvious and it is disturbing that they are not, they are factually false. Among the most interesting aspects of this in the current is that the notion is seriously critiqued within the relevant feminist lit as it pertains to men, yet it is uncritically accepted as it applies to women. Consider this as it relates to sexual interactions in particular. It is each participant's body, and hence it is each participant's choice. Sounds fine. Again. However, such leaves on the table the entire mechanics, pragmatics, and reality of how folks make such choices together. See especially iterative gendered sexual violence, sexual violence as societal norm and consideration of some solutions for an understanding of and how to handle such things. The disposition to hold that such is a one-way determination in any context already betrays its underpinning principle. If it is one way, then it is not the case that it is my body, my choice, for at least one of the participants, and arguably for either or any. Insofar as folks try to make it one way, arguably they are committing rape, sexual assault, sexual violence, and so forth, again, see the aforementioned pieces in this series. In the current, this disposition is expressly gendered, whereby the assumption is that the one-way decision-making is in the hands of women, more broadly, the receivers. Such can be understood in hardly any other way than as a rape cultural expression on the part of women. Not all women of course winky face. Nonetheless the, my body, my choice, notion has applicability. Again, though, the mechanisms of how that kind of choice is determined actually matters, and it is critical to not hold that it is a one-way determination thereof. This section attempts to hold a sex-positive view, whereby the ethically valid mechanisms of that are applicable. The disposition is strongly related to the power-grabbing notion, though on an interpersonal level. As a matter of wooing, flotation, touch that is actually intended to be sexual, in the sense of wooing, in the current, my body, my choice, gives the impression that there is something wrong with touching someone else. As noted rather inflammatorily earlier in this series, such wooing practices can actually include gently caressing someone's genitals as a means of showing sexual interests and yet still be ethically fine. Briefly, I'll note that as a guy I have had women do this to me on multiple occasions. I didn't take it as a negative, because in the context of the situation, I understood that such was exactly a wooing. If it was done out of the proper context, it would have been taken as a negative. I only briefly want to note this as I do not particularly want to dwell on the point beyond this, I suspect that the efforts were juvenile coming from women as they were. That is, women, in this culture, do not generally initiate, and so the initiating of sexuality took on a rather juvenile and direct form. Though I'd also suggest that some of that likely also stems from a failure to recognize that women can even really do sexual violence to men, 
a sort of innocence on that matter that enabled them to express sexual interest in a rather strikingly delicate, direct and beautiful way. Rather, I want to suggest that there are less inflammatory touchings that are normal expressions of flirtatiousness. To gently caress someone's thigh for instance, as a means of showing sexual interest, playing footsies, caressing someone's arm, and so forth. These are done without express verbal consent because they are understood as cultural expressions of showing interest and there is no harm involved. To hold that there is some kind of harm involved is so outrageous it is difficult to understand how anyone can take the claim seriously. Nonetheless, it is the case that some folks make the claim and there is a rationale for it it's just that the rationale is so bad that it's difficult to take it seriously. The rationale stems from my body, my choice, and holds that the harm is a violation of my capacity to choose what happens to my body. I want to be super clear on that point though, that harm isn't physical, it isn't detrimental to the person in any way whatsoever, it is a violation of their bodily autonomy. That deserves some explanation as to what it could mean. The sense in which it is used is to hold that bodily autonomy implies the capacity to make a decision regarding what happens to one's body, not the capacity to decide what one does with one's own body. That distinction is fairly critical as it holds the view that bodily autonomy entails the capacity to determine what others do with their bodies. Moreover, the claim doesn't comport well with the notions of what is generally meant by bodily autonomy. Bodily autonomy generally means the capacity to determine what one does with their own body. So the claim, then, is that someone exercising their own bodily autonomy infringes upon my own capacity to exercise bodily autonomy where the former refers to the understanding of bodily autonomy as the capacity to do what one wants with their own body, and the latter refers to the capacity to choose what happens to one's body. But of course it doesn't. A gentle caress on the thigh with sexual intent doesn't actually entail that the person's bodily autonomy has been infringed upon. The claim may be something like, when someone exercising their own bodily autonomy includes actions that touch not necessarily affect me, it follows that my capacity to exercise my own bodily autonomy has been violated. This is an odd claim, in that it doesn't entail anything like an affective form. Note that typically the claim that would be relevant relates to harm, that is, folks are free, have bodily autonomy, insofar as they are not harming someone else. It is a bit unclear as to what difference could be meant between affect and harm, but nonetheless this is the kind of distinctions that proponents of the claim that a touch infringes upon bodily autonomy actually have held. It may be the case that the affective form therein is something like the touch could turn me on, turn me off, bother me feel good, etc. There is a meaningful distinction therein, but folks, women and men, really ought to consider the notion in relation to the bodily autonomy to have any effective action whatsoever. That is, if we were to hold to this as a formal ethical claim, then it would follow quite straightforwardly that any kind of action that has effective form is at the least suspect. Aside from paralysis in action, pragmatics of actions, etc., folks ought seriously consider the effect that has on the other notion of bodily autonomy. Namely, rather than the principle that one can do what one wants with their body so long as one isn't harming someone else, the claim becomes, one can do whatever one wants with their body provided that it has no affective form to it. That claim, in essence, is, do what you want, so long as it doesn't have any effect on anyone anywhere at all. Which as a principle is extremely dubious. For folks thinking that this merely applies to sexuality, they would be sorely mistaken. Nor for that matter would it merely apply to men. The exact same reasoning is utilized infamously by folks who hold that the way someone dresses has an effect on other people 
and hence they ought not dress that way. There are a host of other kinds of examples, but the point is that there isn't any sound reasoning to not apply the same reasoning. There isn't anything special about touching, that is, there isn't anything particularly effective about touching. Speaking, after all, is far more effective than touch. Nor for that matter is there anything special about men doing the touching. Women do touching all the time, the exact same is applicable to them. I'd go so far as to strongly suggest that in point of fact women far more freely and off touch without bothering to try and get expressed verbal consent, I suspect because folks are foolishly and sexistly applying the criteria to men only. Women, in other words, touch far more oft and freely, even as a means of showing sexual interest, because no one even bothers to think that women could do a sexual harm to men. In the relevant lead, the argument for applying bodily autonomy principles to touch is exactly something like the following, if something so trivially ineffective, something so casual yet personal, something so obviously applicable to the body as the right to determine who, when and if someone can touch you is not included in the notion of bodily autonomy, it is difficult to see how anything of the sort could be included within the notion. There is intuitiveness to the position. It sounds a lot like it is something that someone ought to have a right to. However, I am pretty sure it is merely sounding and not soundness. Aside from the preceding paragraph's criticisms, I want to suggest that the proper right is to not having one's body harmed. The argument as a matter of ethical concern is that touch is fundamental to existence. I want to try and be clear as to why that matters. If touch is fundamental to existence, then to hold that one has a fundamental ethical right to not be touched one is essentially holding to a principle that one has a right in existence to not exist. I am fairly positive readers are going to have a fairly difficult time following that argument, so I will try to expand on it with some examples. To exist at all, in these bodies at any rate, in the reality we are all living in, your body is in contact with things around you. The air, space-time, the ground, etc., to exist at all is to be touching. It would be extremely odd to hold that within that reality that somehow there is a right to not be touched in general without giving some kind of express prior permission to do so. That air didn't ask permission to touch me, how dare it, and the audacity of the ground to touch my feet. These sorts of things are simply inherent to the state of existence, they are not rights against which we might hold a claim to not have happened. Moreover, all that touching inherently has affective form upon you. To have one's body affected at all is, again, simply a part of existing. The point therein being that as a matter of ethics that bare minimum of touch is not something that is of meaningful ethical concern. This isn't to suggest that there are therefore no instances whereby someone's touching someone else might be considered ethically dubious, but the point is that there isn't any obvious or perhaps even an obvious reasons to suppose that as a norm of practice regarding touch at all, that anyone has any particular right to not be touched as a matter of basic bodily autonomy. Again, here we are rather specifically touching upon the rationale used to justify the claim that touch is bad, specifically, that bodily autonomy entails the inherent right to not be touched. Such isn't to say, again, that there are no instances whereby touch may be bad, indeed, whereby even sexualized touch may be bad. It is to really destroy the rationale that is used to justify the position that touch is prima facie bad, as the position is so bad that it is practically incoherent on every possible level of interpretation. On a fundamental level, as just shown, as in, just existing entails touch, to a pragmatic level, having any sexuality at all pragmatically entails touch and sexuality is not an inherent bad, to a sniff test level, as in, 
Plenty of cultures around the world have and continue to use touch in a wide variety of ways as a means of greeting, parting ways, and sexualized interactions without anything even approaching a verbalized consent being given. The disposition being touched upon and touted here is so bad that it would criminalize the saying hello of those strange different cultures. A fucking yakis being proclaimed about something that one simply doesn't particularly understand nor care for themselves. It is clearly a puritanical, sex-negative view that may be rooted in a kind of paranoid phobia regarding being touched, especially in a sexualized way. That is, to be blunt, it may be stemming from a disposition of actual rape victims' trauma views regarding sexuality. That last point will be gently touched upon shortly. There remains very plausibly rights to control specifications of touch, specifically touch predicated upon other ethical concerns, such as harms. Actual harms caused via some kind of touching contact are very plausible instances whereby touch ought be restricted. Let's look at the notion that a touch is causing harm. It can get nuance in the following sense, the harm is an emotional sort of harm, a feeling of being violated, of having some action done to me that I didn't want or ask for. This is not as outrageous a sort of claim, but there are meaningful issues as a matter of pragmatics. It is fair to hold that there may be some emotional harms associated with unwanted touch. I would want to firstly distinguish that a bit from the earlier discussion regarding wanted and unwanted touch in the context of already consented to sexual agreements, that is, the notions presented that touch is generally wanted, sexuality is generally wanted, pleasurable, and so forth. Here we are dealing with the pre-expressed consent to sexual interaction, the wooing sorts of actions. What constitutes wooing in a legitimate sense? What constitutes unwanted touch, violations, not of bodily autonomy, but rather violations in the sense of harm to one's feelings? The supposition is that touch when expressed in a sexual manner, that is, with intent of wooing, is something that is out of bounds. In the pragmatics, the following is true, because the harm is relative to the person receiving the touch, its wanted or unwanted status becomes relative to the degree of desirability of the person doing the touching. This is something of a no-brainer, but bears pointing out that as a law in the sense of criminalizing such sexualized touching as a matter of wooing the law would have to hinge on a feeling that isn't actually universally applicable. In effect, Ugly people are those who are affected primarily by this sort of law. This point can be ameliorated by holding that the persons doing the touching ought be able to tell when the touch is wanted or unwanted, they ought be able to read the situation. We might well ought note that such is reversible, as in, the touch ought be able to tell the situation rather than trying to blanketly criminalize sexualized touch. But here we get to the larger, more important point, regarding what these kinds of concerns are grappling with, differing cultural dispositions as to what may constitute validity of touch in a wooing process. Such dispositions are, to be gentle about it, odd. To be harsh about it they are foundational to racisms and cultural genocides. The notion, in other words, that there is a wrong cultural expression of wooing, predicated upon the feeling of someone who themselves is not fully aware of what the cultural norms of behavior are. A gentle caress on the thigh, after all, simply doesn't harm anyone in any sense beyond that of a feeling of being violated. It may very well be the case that folks simply want a cultural change, and I don't see any particular reason why a cultural change couldn't happen. But it begs the questions, a cultural change towards what and wherefore. More importantly as a matter of begging of the questions, how and do we really want to criminalize other kinds of cultural expressions? If the disposition is that touch within the context of wooing is a bad, that goes always. 
And folks ought to seriously consider if the kind of culture they are advocating for is actually the sort of cultural expression they would even want to be in. Do they, in other words, want to live in a culture where touching someone as a matter of wooing is banned? Such touching at all is criminalized. Sex-positive people ought to seriously consider the degree of stigmatization that actually implies regarding sexuality, that there is something so abhorrent about sexuality that the mereness of a touch, a gentle caress on the thigh, is considered a criminalizable behavior. From the initiator's perspective, what that amounts to is an outright refusal to initiate any touch whatsoever. Not because of any sense of ethical wrongness, but rather out of a sense of understanding that to initiate at all in that context is to the ruination of the life of the initiators. Over a touch. The consequences of a touch, a caress of the thigh in an attempt at wooing, the ruination of the life of the toucher. The harm caused to the touch, at most, a hurt bit of feelings. Without any sense of venom attached to the statement, that sort of disposition is reminiscent of someone with a kind of autistic understanding of human interactions. Specifically, that the cultural context is not understood to the point of failing to grasp the touching as an ethical good, and instead, interpreting it as an ethical bad, because, after all, the touch didn't expressly verbally say that they wanted it. It is rather dubious that people in general ought to operate cultural practices, mating behavior, sexual behavior more generally, under law, within an autistic kind of understanding. Similar can and ought be said regarding the potential actual harms that can be associated with unwanted touch when the touched has some other condition that actually makes the emotional harms involve a more severe and realistic kind of concern. Here I am specifically referring to folks that have been sexually victimized. In those cases, I think most folks would tend to agree that there is a more significant harm happening to them when someone sexually touches their thigh without them expressly asking or agreeing to it. However, even there, and this is pretty important to note, from the perspective of victims among the serious concerns thereof is exactly that they not become stigmatized and essentialized to their traumatic experiences. In other words, even from a victim's perspective, it is plausibly the case that they want to exactly overcome those issues because they exactly, generally at any rate, are desirous of sexual and romantic relations that are not stymied in such a way. To try and be clear on that point, it isn't as if, from the victim's perspective, the desire to not be touched is something that they themselves are happy about. It is an unfortunate consequence of the sexual abuse they suffered. Something that, ideally, they would want to not have to deal with. This even if, due to the trauma, they are actually avoidant of touch, fearful of it, or even paranoid of it. To predicate a law or a cultural norm upon something like that seems incredibly perverse. It validates the unwanted consequences of sexual abuse victims, as if those unwanted consequences, those practically hated consequences, are indeed, the way that society and cultures ought to be. To put this in individualized terms, if, and indeed when I have dated sexual abuse survivors, part of the process of dealing with things was and is exactly to overcome those hated and unwanted feelings, to be blunt about it, to learn to enjoy sexualized touch and sexuality in general again. Doing so entails, inevitably, actually doing the touch, and such may entail various complex and subtle modes of interaction, trust building, and so forth. But then, those are exactly not the sorts of things that other people generally need in order to feel comfortable within society, and those are exactly the sorts of things that normalize cultural expressions of sexualized touch provide people. Such normalized instances of sexualized touch, in other words, inform people as to when, where, how, with whom, etc., that such things as a sexualized touch on the thigh is appropriate. 
they provide exactly the context whereby such things as highly sexualized behavior are appropriate. There are a few points to that as it relates to the criminalization of touch. As with the autistic takes, it is awkward to apply as a law to cultural practices something that is specifically applicable to only a minority subset of the population. I don't want to suggest that there are no instances whereby such minority applicable ethical considerations ought be applied more generally, ADA-related laws come to mind for example. But I do want to rather strongly suggest that there are serious broader scale harms associated with doing so, and that there is its own kind of oddity to make cultural practices a matter of law. Specifically, to inculcate a given cultural practice into law is to expressly legalize the destruction of any and all other cultural practices. Compared to a notion of law that seeks to enable as wide a set of ethically valid cultural practices as is possible. This aspect of the concerns is covered in the criminalization, culturalization section in this series. It is also at best unclear if these kinds of legitimate concerns are really being addressed in the longer term. That is, while it may be the case that in a short-term consideration the ethical concern regarding the harms of such touching is valid, in the longer term it is almost exactly not the kind of thing anyone would actually want, and hence it would become ethically abhorrent even to the people for whom it has a plausible short-term benefit. Such is, after all, strongly reminiscent of Victorian mores made manifest into authoritarian laws. The shock of being wooed via a sexualized touch upon thy thigh, enough to bring out the fainting couch, and also the militarized police. There is a plausible retort that is very much worth bringing up, namely the disposition that sexual assault by men against women is common. The retort relates strongly in a few ways, it potentially denotes a rape culture in the sense that is more generally used in the current as opposed to the rape culture I've presented in this series, and its commonness retorts directly to the preceding points, e.g. if it is common then it would potentially make sense to force the change in the culture via law as it wouldn't be merely applicable to a minority of people. I am simply going to point out the major issues I see whenever I have viewed this through the lens of statistics and through the lens of practical interactions with people, especially as they regard sexualized interactions and considerations of perceived ethical fouls thereof. However, that aspect requires a significant deal of explanation, so I shall leave it for the next video in this series. Here I want to sum up the points regarding the slogan under consideration, my body, my choice. Whose body, whose choice? How can these things merely apply to one participant in the interaction? How can this slogan even make sense at all within a contextual situation that inherently involved more than one body, more than one choice? This slogan in particular highlights a kind of blindness on the part of people whereby the assumption that the body of concern is rather strictly that of the woman. The slogan and its related beliefs are predicated upon a notion of men as always being DTF, an assumption of sexual interest on the part of men, which, as has been delved into more deeply before in this series, is a derivative of the initiator-receiver relationship as a strongly gendered structure. That men are supposed to initiate entails that they are supposedly already self-determining their own desires in the first place. Which, while not entirely untrue, sometimes dudes be horny AF, covers over a lot of other motivations, and ignores the reality of the receiver's own sexual interests manipulations, desires, etc. This position notes the broadly applicable disposition towards its negation, that the bodies of concern are the lovers involved, the choices thereof being goods not already seeking a redemption from one of the participants, but expressions of wants, needs, and desires of the lovers involved. you going
Keep me safe in your arms 